Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us here and uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us online. Uh, tonight we're on uh, lesson 77 of our series, uh, A Journey to Faith. And tonight's title is Daniel's Shaggy Goat Arise. And he, of course, is Alexander the Great. So before we go into the lesson, on the screen here, we have a picture of a coin that's minted and of course this is the head of Alexander the Great and there's two things that you'll notice on there which are probably not normal uh, to see. Uh, there's the horn here and there's the what's called the diadem which is this uh, cord with these two tassels that hang down the back. So first question, what does the diadem symbolise? is a king so a diadem is a sign of their uh, royal coronation a king will wear a diadem when there's not wearing an actual uh, uh, crown itself and anyone like to hazard the guess of what the the horn is a symbol shaggy goat. shaggy goat it's a goat's horn and so we'll have a little bit more of a look during the course of the lesson what that symbolic meaning of the goat's horn is. But the Lord is very, very clever because 220 years in one of the visions of Daniel, he saw the goat, the shaggy goat. Okay? And so that means that this symbolism, which appears in conjunction with Alexander the Great and following Greeks, was actually something which pointed to the fact that they're talking about Alexander the Great himself. And so it's extraordinary out of all the detail that here we arrive with a coin of Alexander and it's got the goat horns on the side. So we'll go into that a little bit more during the lesson. So just to start off today, as we usually do, we're just going to uh, put up the chart, the genealogy of Jesus. Of course, is what the lessons are all based on. We are in the last portion from Matthew chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. It's after the exile to Babylon. And we're all the way down to this descendant called Zadok. Now, Zadok, if you actually count all of these descendants before we get to Jesus, he's actually seven forefathers before Jesus. And so we're getting closer and closer to the time of the Lord. And so um, it's starting to get... Uh, more interesting as we go outside of the normal scriptures of the Bible, but we see history fulfilling the visions of Daniel and the prophetic words. Now, uh, as I keep moving this table that I have, I progressively move it down. So we've moved it down again. On the table here, this column on the left and this column on the right represents the genealogy of Jesus, one in the book of Luke and one in the book of Matthew. The one on the right is in the book of Matthew, and the one on the left is from the book of Luke. For the, this is the first time we're showing this part of the screen, but the prophecies that said that both descendants uh, would come from David is fulfilled because we find here at the end of each of these genealogical lists that we have Joseph here, and we also have Joseph here. So he actually appears on both of the lists. He's not a different Joseph. It's Joseph, the it's the Joseph, I should say, the legal father of Jesus. But because he married Mary and females weren't listed in the genealogical list, his name is placed there by marriage. And so he becomes the son of Heli, who is the father of Mary. Of course, the prophecy was so incredible that not just one line of descendants uh, was fulfilled with Jesus coming, but we find that both lines of descendants became parents of Jesus. And so this is what this left-hand side represents. So we're on uh, this descendant, uh, Zadok. And so we've got his uh, estimated birth date at 372 BC. And during the reign, if you look at this colour that's here, this uh, turquoise sort of colour, we've got the end of the Persian Empire rulers here. And so currently we're in Artaxerxes II Memnon, uh, the ruler, and you see that during the life of Zadok, these colours come to an end and we see that the Persian Empire comes to an end. Then we have the start of the Greek Empire, which is uh, happening at the same time as the demise of the Persian Empire. 
and it goes from Alexander III here and you can see here that we actually have seven changes of rulers during the time of this one person's life. So what this tells us about the time of Zadok is all of the peace that had occurred under the Persian Empire for the Jewish people, things are going to start rattling along a bit now because these changes of rulers have implications. This list flows all the way through until we get to an independent Judea in 164 BC and then we have the period of the Maccabees and then at the end of the period of the Maccabees who comes along but the Roman Empire in 63 BC and of course when Jesus was born the Roman Empire is already in place and so this is the uh, the chart and the uh, descendants that will follow by name and we'll explain each of them as we're going along. Now as we mentioned uh, each week just to put a uh, meaning to the name, the province of Judea at this part, at this point in time, it's still part of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. It's known as Yehud Medinata in Persian, Yehud for Jews, Medinata for Mediterranean, so it's the Jewish people who live by the Mediterranean. You can see it only occupies this portion of land here, and there's a coastal corridor which is not actually part of their province. And as you'll see from today's lesson and future lessons, this becomes really important because this coastal corridor is going to get a workout between the Greeks and the Egyptians, and, and so this begins. The Persian Empire at this point in time is represented by everything that's in yellow, apart from this striped yellow over here, which is Egypt, because Egypt has already separated from the Persian Empire. But we find uh, at this point in time, as I mentioned, for Zadok, born at 372 BC, that all of the solid yellow here is still part of the Persian Empire. And Zadok is born in the province of Judea, over here, in the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes II. And so I will just leave that up as we get underway today. So Zadok is the fourth descendant who is born in the, under the rule of the Persian Achaemenid Empire, as I said, in the province of Judea in the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes II, who is the great king or the Shah of Persia, as he's known. Zadok is going to be the first descendant in the genealogical list who will be alive when the Macedonian Empire which is ruled by Alexander the Great, begins to grow and become a dominant force which is eventually going to take over the Persian Empire. So what we find uh, at this point in time is that Zadok, like his forebears, was born in the town of Bethlehem. So he's not living in Jerusalem. So he's in a small rural town away from the capital city. Um, and during this time, combined with financial corruption, this growing dissatisfaction will cause the unity of the Persian Achaemenid Empire to slowly dissolve until Alexander the Great invades and conquers them to fulfill the prophetic word of the Lord given by the prophet Daniel. So tonight we're going to begin to bring to life the journey of Zadok. Now, although in many ways the Persian Achaemenid Empire appeared to retain control because it's very large but they have lost Egypt. It began to show cracks in the territories that were first knitted together under King Cyrus the Great and then it was enlarged by King Darius I. Much effort and finances had been successfully expended to protect its interest in Asia Minor but they had lost Egypt to changeable yet indigenous monarchy who had been able to repel foreign rule more than once. And so Asia Minor, uh, as it says on the map behind me, is this region up here. And Asia Minor, of course, is part of modern day Turkey. So this is what's known as Asia Minor. In 372, where we begin the journey, rebellion in Asia Minor surfaced again when the governor of Cappadocia had problems with the court of the Persian Achaemenid Empire, and so Cappadocia is this part of the region up here on the map, so I'll leave the map up behind me as I go. 
and the governor revolted and the neighbouring governors of Lydia and Lycia were ordered to crush him. But this governor was a talented military commander and he led his army to repel their attacks. And this began a period of time that became known in history as the revolt of the satraps, and satraps is the Persian word for governor. And so a rebellion of other satraps will join during the reign of King Artaxerxes II. Okay, now the province of Fergia, uh, which is here on the map, in Asia Minor was divided into two administrative areas under Persian rule. There was a lesser and a greater Fergia. So the governor of the greater Fergia had been made the acting governor of the lesser Fergia until the legitimate the legitimate heir of, of the, uh, that should have been uh, ruling, sorry, just find one up to, uh, was old enough to take office. So he was ruling both because the heir to this, uh, this uh, area here had a upper and a lower region. And the lower region, the next descendant who should have reigned in the office was a child. And so the person to, in the larger area was ruling on his behalf. But when the time arrived, he of course refused to give it up and chose to join the revolt from Cappadocia. So they chose to secede from the empire. Does anyone know what to secede means? It means to step back, leave, no longer participate. And so they also means that they refused to recognize the authority of the Persian empire. And so they sought foreign aid. He received this from Sparta's king, but the satrap of Caria to the southwest and the satrap of Lydia, so that's the governors to the west, then besieged his province. So these are these ones here. So what's actually happening is this whole region is in conflict. Remember the prophecy of Daniel, they said that the Greeks would come from the west. And so from up here, they will come through here. So this whole region is in this complex breaking down and people trying to take power from one another. The Greeks were coming back and forth as we've seen in previous lessons. And so we see that the prophecy that we're talking about is actually beginning to unfold as it crumbles. The other region of Armenia, which is up here, further to the east, it was also uh, beginning to rebel as well. So, as I said, this is just starting to open up a bigger problem. Now, in the same uh, year, a pharaoh in Egypt um, was succeeded, who was called Nectanabo I, who we looked at last week. He was succeeded by his son, who was called Teos. And like his father before him, so that's his name here, Pharaoh Teos, and like his father before him, he was actually sending financial support to all of those in Asia Minor who were rebelling against the Persian Empire. So what's going on here is that the people in Egypt were being supported by the Greeks. And so when they were having a problem, the Egyptians would send them finances or, or support to fight. And when they were having a problem, the Greeks would come down and they would support the Egyptians. And so everything that was coming against the Persian Empire was coming from the West. Once again, a lot of history, but fulfilling the biblical prophecy. And so we find that these people who become enemies in the future, at this point in time, it suited them to become allies. Now, 10 years after the revolt of the satraps, as it was called, began, their solidarity began to unravel because the, the governor from Armenia, who had been acknowledged as the leader of all of the, of the different uh, regions, uh, he was married to the daughter of King Artaxerxes II. So you can see the complexity. He's actually married to his enemy's father. Okay. Um, sorry, his father's daughter. <laughs> so he was seen, however, as someone who could negotiate a compromise with the king, um, but he 
ended up betraying the other governors in exchange for territories that form most of the Aegean coast. So this is all of this along here. So everybody along the way is all out for themselves. And so we find that this is part of the, the to- what's happening at the time. So his betrayal led to others and the governor of Cappadocia was killed because his own son-in-law killed him. And the governor of Phrygia was crucified because his own son betrayed him. And so it's really starting to implode. After the betrayal of the governor from Armenia and the two sons of the satraps from Cappadocia and Phrygia, the other satraps or governors ended their rebellion and they were pardoned. And so they established control again as the Persian Empire. Now growing up, Pharaoh Teos had witnessed the success of his father, Nectanabo I, because he was the one who overcame the invading Persians and pulled uh, Egypt away from the Persian Empire. So ascending the throne of his father after serving with him as a co-regent for three years, Teos was encouraged to fulfil his father's plan to attack the Persian Achaemenid Empire by beginning his invasions through the former territory of Phoenicia on the eastern coastline of the Mediterranean. And so on the map over here, this is the region here which was ancient Phoenicia. So these four different locations. So these four locations were actually separate um, provinces under the Persian Achaemenid Empire. And so Pharaoh Teos sets off on land to head up here to go and take them and the Greeks join him and come down, meet him by sea and then they shadow him by water all the way along. So here's the people in Judea. For the first time, people are starting to move up and down this corridor beside them and it's going to become inevitable that they're going to get drawn into some of these conflicts. So this is uh, the next stage that actually happens. So in the spring of 360 BC, they, they fulfilled all their preparations and Pharaoh Teos imposed new taxes to extract money from every part of, the, of people's lives in Egypt, apparently taking large sums of funds from various temples. So in other words, because he was trying to actually grow his empire and take over some of the Persians, he was now actually destabilizing his own reign in Egypt. So the people began to resent him because he was taking money from them all the time. So he became unpopular. In conjunction with this, a navy of 200 Greek triremes, the warships, as we have on the pictures uh, behind us here, they were built and they were sent with an, uh, with an admiral, admiral, an admiral uh, called Chabrius. So Sparta's king, who is now in his 80s, also came to assist with an army of mercenaries and the pharaoh's nephew, who's called Nakhtharheb, came to lead the Egyptian soldiers who altogether would attack the territory formerly known as uh, Phoenicia, as we mentioned here. So as I said, they were, meant, they were drawn up into these four coastal provinces or city-states that I've just mentioned. And up until now, war from those who sought to free themselves from the Persian Empire had occurred predominantly in Greece, Asia Minor and Egypt. So here, here and here. And so this marks the first time that they've come onto this part of the, the coast in the Persian uh, Empire. So at this point in time, Zadok, uh, we work out that his age would have been around 12. And of course, this was something where all the people there were concerned because they brought the threat closer to their own home. So Teos <coughs> made himself the supreme commander of the expedition and he left his brother behind in Egypt to govern in his absence. The Egyptian soldiers marched from the delta. They were joined by the boats, as we mentioned, as they headed all the way up uh, to this ancient area of Phoenicia. When they arrived, most of the city-states they had come to conquer, instead of fighting them, they chose to join them, and this spelt danger for the Persian Empire. As each of the provinces rose up against them, the numbers in opposition continued to swell. But all was not well for Sparta's king, 
claimed that it was he, not the Pharaoh, who was supreme commander, and the brother of Pharaoh Teos plotted against him in Egypt. So even while the Pharaoh's away, we find that his brother back here and uh, the ruler from Sparta, they're joining together to now come against the Pharaoh. So everywhere we look, somebody's having a go at, at somebody. Uh, so the taxes taken from the people and the funds taken from the temples caused the popularity of Teos uh, to plummet. And with the support of the people and the priesthood, the Pharaoh's brother convinced his son to rebel against him. Now his son was actually with the Pharaoh over in this area of Syria as it is today. So it wasn't too hard for him to persuade the Spartan king to support him either because he was having numerous disagreements with the Pharaoh. So this, uh, this uh, nephew, Nachthareb, rose up against his uncle who without support fled and found himself in the court of his enemy at Susa in Persia. And so we just put the next map on. So we just explode this to a larger region. And so this is all what you've just seen. So he takes off and he ends up going to Susa. Well, what's Susa? It's the capital of Persia. And that's where the king Artaxerxes II uh, resides. So what's going to happen to the, his enemy when he arrives here? He's not going to get any sympathy, is he? He's actually just run himself straight into uh, at the lion's den, so to speak. And so he didn't know where else to go, so for some reason, this is where he went. So on the same expedition as a doctor, a noble called Wenifer was sent to look for Teos, and when they learned that the pharaoh fled to Susa, he was able to have him held by King Artaxerxes. Going to Susa, Wenifer then brought him back in chains to his nephew, who had taken the throne name Pharaoh Nactanabo II. And here is a bust, or the remains of one, of this very uh, pharaoh on the map over here. And so what we've had happen, we had a pharaoh who tried to go big. Everyone came in behind him, didn't like him because of all the funds he raised. He ran off to his enemy and then he ends up being deposed and his own nephew takes over the country at the same time. And so uh, you wouldn't want to be an ancient king, would you? Very unstable. Um, now, King Artaxerxes II sent his third son, who was called Ochus, and we'll come to that name a little bit later because he becomes a future um, uh, king or uh, emperor of the Persian Empire. Um, he'd sent this particular son to stop Teos from advancing but it became unnecessary because the pharaoh's nephew uh, took control. And so the Greeks were dismissed and the pharaoh, the new pharaoh, returned home to Egypt with his army. So what happened in effect was they lost one pharaoh, replaced by another, but Egypt was still its own sovereign nation at this point in time. At this point in history, in 359 BC, the very next year, Philip, the youngest son of a king called Amentus III, acceded the throne of Macedon as Philip II. In 357 BC, he married Princess Olympias and fathered a son in 356 BC. Would you like to guess who that son was? It was Alexander the Shrine. Alexander the Great was their son. And so at this point in time, whilst this conflict's going on, Alexander the Great was born Macedon, it's not marked specifically on the map, but it sits right here next to Thracia at the top part of uh, Greece up here. And so Alexander is born. And so we move into the time where Alexander's now a real person. Sorry, one moment. So King Artaxerxes, he'd been ruling at this stage for 44 years and his eldest son, Crown Prince Darius, felt he was entitled to ascend the throne. He entered into a conspiracy to murder his father, but the king found out and the royal court sentenced him to death. As the next in line, he had another son called Ariaspes. He then became heir to the throne and, he was, and a popular prince at court, his younger brother Ochus, who had his own ambitions to rule, wanted him out of the way. So the third son is trying to now take out the second son. The first son's already been uh, put to death. 
So the conspirators who first sought to murder King Artaxerxes, so it's incredible, isn't it? So King gets old and all the sons start to go crazy uh, to take over and they start fighting one another. So the conspirators who first sought to, to murder King Artaxerxes included Ochus and a commander of the royal guard. Together they managed to convince Ariaspes, this is the son who is now the crown prince, that his father was suspicious of him being involved in his planned murder and deeply troubled, he chose to commit suicide. And so what first son, who was the heir, was murdered. The second son was told that uh, the king thought that he was a conspirator and so he committed suicide. And so the pathway opened up for the third son to step in place. So King Artaxerxes then turned his hope to his fourth son, who is called Assams, because he didn't actually like Ochus. Good reason, isn't it? But this only led to another son being murdered. And so he lost another son. So in his last days, he's having one son after another son after another son uh, dying or being murdered, who he actually loved. In 358 BC, King Artaxerxes died, and they say in the historical record, in what was believed to be a broken heart for his, from his children's behaviour. So Ochus succeeded him as king to be crowned Artaxerxes III Ochus, and his first action was to execute over 80 members of the royal family, beginning with his own siblings. So this not only safeguarded him against future plots, but also created fear of him amongst his subordinates. And so, uh, I don't know that the Greeks and the Egyptians are going to have to do too much more because, you know, these uh, the Persian Empire is imploding. So this picture here, this is actually the burial site or the tomb of T King Artaxerxes II, who's called Memnon. Um, and I'm going to show you another uh, picture a little bit later, which shows you all these tombs together so you can get a better picture for them. But each of the tombs, they had a door in under here. They carved a section out of the rock face and, and they had this symbolism on the top. So if you have a look up here, it actually has the king standing here. It has this symbolism for their religion, which is called Zoroastrianism. And over here, you actually have a representation of the planet. And of course, this is what Zoroastrian was. They, they worshipped the stars, the sun and the moon. And so this particular... Uh, symbolism was put on all of them but the face of the particular king who passed away would be carved according to which king it was and so that's his tomb and whilst I launch into the next portion I'm going to put this up on the board just to help explain what's going on so in 355 BC King Artaxerxes III the new king he began to strengthen the Persian Empire again because it's obviously in a bit of trouble. In Asia Minor to the west, he forced Athens to accept its allies were no longer sovereign dependents and withdraw the troops from the region in peace. A campaign was then made against Caduceus. We mentioned this the other week. You can't actually see its name, but it's, on, it's underneath this uh, writing here on this bottom part of the Caspian Sea. They actually raised up before and uh, backed off. And so they actually are raising up again in this region. Uh, so the two provincial kings who ruled the Cadusians were successfully subdued as uh, subjects of King Artaxerxes III again. So the king then ordered the armies of each province in Asia Minor to be disbanded altogether because they were all rising up. And so he said, that's it, no more armies. They never guaranteed any peace in the West and he had good reason to be concerned that these armies would revolt again in the future. Uh, so the, the governor of Lydia and Mysia didn't like this and they chose to ignore the order. And so the governor from Lydia asked Athens to help them rebel against the king and assistance was sent to Sardis over here. And so this trouble is not going away. Now, Mycia had joined with them, which is a little bit further to the north here. So all these locations in Asia Minor. So they joined with them, and together they managed to defeat an army that was sent by King Artaxerxes III in 354 BC. But one year later, another army came, and it was overturned, and the Persians took over it again. So 
the communication and following the history just sees conflict after conflict and the the um, power struggle saw one uh, opposition rule and then the Persians come back into power then another opposition rule then the Persians come back into power and it went on like this okay now the the uh, the governor uh, who had started this uh, from Lydia he actually fled and he ended up in the court of King Philip II of Macedon who is the father of Alexander the Great okay so we see them coming together so King Artaxerxes next turned his attention to the recovery of Egypt and in 351 BC he led a vast army on campaign so I'll just read the short note here uh, to explain this it says that King Artaxerxes III led an army against Pharaoh Nectanebo in 351 BC and after an extended battle he was defeated in 350 BC the Persian king returned in 343 BC and after an extended battle in and around Pelusium, which is located here on the coast, he defeated the pharaoh in 342 BC and returned Egypt back under rule of the Persian Empire. And so we see that under this particular ruler, he actually gains this territory back once again. Now one of the things that comes up in the history record is that Jews that were living in Egypt were actually sent to this place called Hyrcania, at the bottom of the Caspian Sea over here, on the south over here. Um, okay, so so we oh so we had this mentioned here as well. Sorry. So after losing the battle against the Egyptians in 351 and 350 BC, Cyprus, Asia Minor and Sidon, they joined by other Phoenician states, rebelled and declared their independence from the Persian Empire. In 343 BC, King Artaxerxes lost the battle trying to recover Sidon, uh, only to return with a much bigger army and he burned them to the ground altogether. Once again here, some Jews had joined the uprising, they're not far away, and they were sent out to Hyrcania. And so we find the historical record that the people in this region, the Jewish people, are now starting to get caught up in the conflicts that are happening either side of them. So it's very historical. Um, so I'm just going to try and give you the main uh, information here. Now in 348 BC, last week we mentioned about a scripture from Nehemiah in chapter 12, and it talked about the six high priests that were listed for the rebuilt second temple of Jerusalem. So in 348 BC, Jadua, who was the son of Jonathan, so he was the sixth high priest, he, uh, he became the, the priest in that particular year, um, and he was said to be in office for 20 years, so the Persian records record this as well. And so he is actually the last high priest of the temple under the authority of the Persian Empire. Okay. And this is uh, important because Alexander the Great actually comes to Jerusalem. Does everyone know that? So we're going to come to this a little bit later. So Alexander the Great comes to Jerusalem to fulfill the word of the Lord given by the prophet Daniel. And there's some circumstances that happen around this because if they resist Alexander the Great, what would happen to them? Right. They would get decimated. He would just kill the whole lot of them but they don't get killed. So that means the high priest basically has to make a decision along with the governor to either open the gates and welcome them or to close the gates and suffer the consequences. And so they've been living at peace under the Persian Empire for a long time and so they're probably more inclined to stay with the Persian. But when they saw Alexander coming, why did they open the gates? Before we get to the story, why would they open the gates when Alexander was coming? <coughs> because they feared him. I don't think they had an army anymore. No, they didn't. That's true. So you're thinking in the natural right now. <laughs> what was really going on? Was it because they knew about the prophecy? Thank you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Right. When Alexander finally comes, they're fully cognizant of Daniel's vision. And so they know he's going to come and he's going to sweep over and take over the world. So if the Lord says to them, he's going to come, what do they do? Mm. Let him come. Oh, 
us. Okay. And so the pro- pro- prophecy of Daniel once again has a role to play in history because when the Greeks came through, the Jews didn't rebel against them. So we'll come to that a little bit later. So seven years passed while King Artaxerxes licked his wounds. Uh, as I said, until in 343 BC. Sorry, this is the part. I won't read through this again. This is the part uh, that happened here. Okay, so the Cyprus, Asia Minor, and Sidon joined to fight against the Persians. They lost the battle trying to recover Sidon, only to return a bigger army, and then they burned them to the ground, and the Jews were sent off to Hyrcania. So uh, that's the next portion that I've got written here. One of the things that's of note while all this is happening is that we can actually see God's hand on this situation because as the Jews who supported the revolt against the Persian Empire came into the position where these other countries are bringing their armies into place, we find that they never get executed. History records that they're always sent away from where they live. And so mentioned twice in history, as I said, they get sent to Hyrcania. And so normally they would be executed, they would be crucified, they would be impaled, but we find that for the Jewish people that they're always relocated. So after King Artaxerxes dealt with this uprising in the surrounding region, his army of 330,000 Persians had 10,000 Greeks from Asia Minor join with them. And they decided that they would again go and invade Egypt. So he divided them into these three divisions and we had what we call the Battle of Pelusium, uh, which I've mentioned over here. So again, I won't read all the way through it, but we find that the Jews were exiled once again uh, to Hyrcania. So Greece, we're going to start talking about Greece. So uh, we're seeing in all of this history, this constant conflict in these regions, as I said, predominantly Uh, in Greece, Asia Minor, and down here in Egypt. We're now starting to see some conflict coming closer to home for the Jewish people. But Greece was a collective of city-states that were originally formed when farmers from the Middle East and West Asia travelled towards Europe looking for better land. So history records that the Greek people who settled over here actually came from this direction over here. And so modern day Greek people who we see as a perhaps different race of people, they've actually traveled a long way. So they kept going west. Why would they keep going west? Because a lot of this land was terribly barren along the way. And so as they went further west, they found that the land was better and better. And so they made their way across to the other side and they formed what were called city states, whom we all know are small kingdoms. So they would have a city, they would have a rural area around them for farming, for crops, for animals, and they would exist in these small uh, kingdoms. So whilst forming common alliances between each other for the purpose of protection and trade, they still perceived that their liberty could only be maintained if they remained as independent city-states. So they sought to stay separate to each other. So when we start talking about the Greeks, as we've already mentioned, we find that they're actually battling against each other as well because they don't actually see themselves as a collective group of people. In reality, however, this liberty led to constant conflicts between them and the alliances they made with others. War was commonplace until King Philip II of Macedon in northern Greece began to change the political landscape after he became king. So the city-states of central Greece, especially Athens and Thebes, were distracted by war between themselves when he began to expand his kingdom in northern Greece to include Thrace and a region called Chalkidiki. And so here's Thrace. So Thrace up until this point in time has been held by the Persians. And so Macedonia is next to them. And so he starts to move across here. So this is King Philip II, who is the father of Alexander the Great. And so he starts to expand the territories and he seeks to have stability for all of the people who come from a shared common background. So King, uh, 
So the, the king continued to expand, and it came mainly at the expense of the Athenians who had a lot of the control. So king Philip II continued to expand through the re- until his reign, uh, until the final alliance of southern Greek city-states led by Athens and Thebes opposed him in a battle in 338 BC. The combined armies of the alliance were decimated, making further war impossible, so King Philip imposed a peace settlement to which they all agreed with the exception of Sparta. And so we see the Greeks starting to come together as one body. This became known as the League of Corinth, so they agreed to be an alliance with a peace, um, and that meant that they would be free from attack from amongst each other, and they'd be free to navigate the waters of the Aegean Sea where they lived. King Philip went about building garrisons throughout Greece to be keepers of the peace and then insisted the newly formed Synod or Council or Assembly of the League declare war on the Persian Achaemenid Empire. And so here we see the beginning of someone who's actually deciding to not just uh, take a little piece of action but to actually go against the whole of the Persian Empire. Now you might have heard this word Synod as a religious term because it's actually used in churches to this day uh, to represent this name of council or assembly. So when he decided to declare war, the assembly agreed and they voted him what they call strategos in Greek, which means he is the military general of the upcoming campaign. And so basically we find that Alexander the Great's father has taken a firm control over the Greek people. So after King Artaxerxes III returned home, to con- he continued to quash uprisings anywhere they rose in the Persian Empire. Seeking stability, he gave Mentor of Rhodes and Bagoas, the Persian eunuch who we spoke about before, who was actually the friend of the fifth high priest Jonathan in Jerusalem. Uh, he gave them positions of great importance because they distinguished themselves as exceptional commanders during the Egyptian campaign. Mentor was appointed governor over the Mediterranean coast of Asia Minor, whilst Bagoas was given responsibility to manage Persia's internal administration and oversee peace throughout the empire. Both were successful, and the Mediterranean coast of Asia Minor fully submitted to Persia, and the Persian empire was peacefully and successfully governed by Bagoas from the Persian capital in Susa. So the Greeks were coming, and the Persians had solidified their position on the other side. Persian forces in Ionia and Lycia in Asia Minor regained control of the Aegean and Mediterranean Sea and took over most of the islands formerly controlled by Athens. Whilst this occurred, the growing power and expansion of the Macedonian Kingdom under King Philip II didn't go unnoticed. So much so that in 340 BC, King Artaxerxes ordered a Persian army to assist a prince from Thrace to maintain his independence. And we can see what happened, he actually lost. Okay, so all of a sudden, uh, because of all of this that was happening, we find that Macedonia grows even more powerful. Um, And at this point in time, because he's now aged 87, Artaxerxes III actually dies in September of that year of 338. So just going to the next uh, picture here. We mentioned this before, so this is yet another tomb. Um, this is the tomb of Artaxerxes III Ochus. Uh, you can see once again, here he is here. Uh, this one's actually got a, a crescent, which is a moon, <coughs> who they worship. This is a modern addition, by the way. This is a staircase that's been built to get up there. But you can see the format of all of their tombs. The tomb's in here, and they would carve this out of the face. And what it looks like in real is like this. So I mentioned this the previous week's call, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Naqsh e Rastam, and it's near Persepolis in Iran, so it's still there today. And you can see this rock face with one, two, three, in fact there's more as you continue along the rock face. So as each of those ancient kings were actually dying, um, they would carve these out. You can see, because of the people down the bottom here, you can see the scale, I don't know if you can make this out here, but there's some gentleman working down here, and there's actually a horse here uh, with one of the kings riding it down here. Down the bottom, they've got all of these sets of lights. So at night time, each of the uh, openings for each of these 
ancient tombs that are lit up for uh, tourists to see, etc. So that's in modern day Iran. So uh, once again, brings truth to the evidence of these kings who actually ruled at this time. So at this time, although they were wary, the Persians didn't know that King Philip II had planned to invade the Persian Empire or that 212 years ago, in 550 BC, God had given the prophet Daniel a vision in which he saw a ram with two horns in Daniel chapter 8 verse 3, charged by a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes from Daniel 8 verse 5. Coming from the west toward the two-horned ram from Daniel 8 6, the goat charged and in Daniel 8 7 it says the ram furiously, the goat charged the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him and none could rescue the ram. So all of this history we're communicating at the moment is actually this process beginning to happen. Now the archangel, of course, explained this to Daniel because at the time he didn't know what it all meant. And so he told his meaning. So in Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 to 21, says the two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of media and persia the shaggy goat is the king of greece and the large horn between his eyes is the first king the king of media and persia wasn't actually to be artaxerxes the third but nor was the king of greece to be king philip the second of macedon and the reason that is is because he didn't actually end up conquering the whole empire. His father, King Philip II, was a Macedonian king who would formed some alliances and he went to attack the Persian Empire. But he wasn't the king of Greece, remember, he was the general, right? He was the strategist, so he was the military commander, he wasn't the king of Greece. And so we can know from this uh, prophecy that when we're trying to identify who the king of Greece is in the, in the vision, it's actually not King Philip II because he wasn't the king of the whole Greek uh, body of people at that time. Okay, so ironically, so we're close to finishing, King Artaxerxes I went the same way he had ended the life of most of his siblings. Remember we mentioned he murdered uh, virtually all of them. So he was murdered and so were most of his family. But he wasn't murdered by a family member. He met his death at the hands of the eunuch Bagoas who he had made vizier or chief minister of the Persian Empire. As the governor of the empire, Bagos not only had so much power that it was he who essentially ruled the empire, but he exercised his given power to kill the very king he served. So this king that we've just shown with his tomb, who died at the age of 87, he was in fact murdered by his chief, um, chief minister. So in late 30, 338 BC, the youngest son of King Artaxerxes was called Arsis. Uh, he was not executed like most of his family because Bagoas needed a member of the royal family to remain in office. Believing Arsis would be easy to control, Bagoas had him crowned Artaxerxes IV to succeed his father as the great Shah of Persia. Now, of course, Bagoas can't become the next king because he can't have any children. Yeah, there's no heirs because he's a eunuch. And so he needed a puppet to control and then he would have the power behind the scenes. And so this is why he actually chose him. But it turns out that this uh, young prince held Bagoas in contempt and it was only a matter of time before this arrangement unraveled and King Artaxerxes IV planned to murder Bagoas. But the scheming chief minister in his role as a high official acted first and poisoned the young king in 336 BC, so yet another generation was killed. The ever scheming Bagoas then put the king's cousin on the throne. The king's cousin was called Artashata, and at the age of 43, he ascended the throne of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. Remember what I showed you the chart at the beginning? There was lots of changes of kings, so we're literally rolling through them all now. Most of them didn't do anything or get anywhere, they were just simply murdered at court. Um, and so he ascended the throne of the Persian Empire and upon his coronation in 336 BC he adopted the throne name Darius after his great-grandfather King Darius II. So he becomes Darius III. 
Much to the chagrin of the uh, vizier Bagoas, King Darius tried to govern without him, and like others in the past, Bagoas tried to poison him, but the king had been warned about this wretched man. So the ambitious and dangerous vizier found himself suffering the same fate, and he was forced to drink the cup of poison and died a painful death. And so this is the Bagoas I mentioned last week, who was mates with the fifth high priest of the Temple of Jerusalem, Jonathan. So any time there was a change in ruler, there were always those who would see it as an opportunity to succeed from the empire. With so many provinces ruled by disloyal governors and populated with rebellious subjects, King Darius III found himself in a precarious situation. He had gained an utterly unstable empire and he neither had the skill nor the ex experience to rule over it. So in the same year that he was crowned and honoured with the titles of King of Persia, King of Babylon and Pharaoh of Egypt, King Philip II of Macedon was authorised by the newly formed League of Corinth to initiate a war. So this is what he did. He declared it and now he was authorised to go ahead. And so the war, in essence, was to take revenge on the Persians who'd uh, caused them a lot of grief over many years um, and one of the reasons they put forward was for desecrating and burning Athens and its temples to the ground in 480 BC. Under the command of, of a couple of generals King Philip sent an army in advance to Asia Minor to liberate the Greeks who lived there under Persian control. <coughs> Successfully recapturing numerous cities they were making their way through the southwestern province of Caria I'll just pop this up on the map. So they came across, so here's Macedon over here. So they came across the Hellespont, which is the Dardanelles, or where Gallipoli was. And then they came down here to Caria. And <coughs> one of the seven bodyguards of King Philip II murdered him in October 336 when he attended the wedding of his daughter. So the bodyguard was caught and killed and the crown prince Alexander was proclaimed king on the spot by both the nobles and the army and Alexander was crowned Alexander III of Macedon at the age of 20. So he wasn't always Alexander the Great, he was Alexander of Macedon. So news of the death of King Philip spread quickly and some of the newly allied states he had brought together either by force or negotiation of course, they saw it as an opportunity to rebel. So ignoring the peace settlement, Thebes, Athens, Thessaly and northern tribes of Thrace acted swiftly to disregard the alliance they had agreed to. The campaign in Asia Minor was also paused and the newly crowned Alexander of Macedon was faced with the task to regain control over Macedonia and most of Greece. Now remember, he's 20 years old. Okay. So... As we mentioned, I'm going to put a picture up in a moment, Alexander III of Macedon is remembered in history as Alexander the Great. In the vision that God gave to the prophet Daniel, he saw that the shaggy goat, who the archangel Gabriel explained was the king of Greece, would become very great, it said in Daniel 8 verse 8. So in other words, he wasn't going to be yet another ordinary king or small king, he was going to become very great. So the Archangel Gabriel also said in uh, verse 5 of Daniel 8 that the prominent horn between the eyes of the goat from the west, he says in 8 verse 21, is the first king. Okay, so there's some details in there. So Alexander III wasn't the first king of Macedon, but he was to be the first king of Greece to fulfill God's plan to strike the ram with two horns. The reason we mention all this is because we're identifying that Alexander the Great is the man who fulfills the prophecy, not his father or his grandfather before him. And so uh, we're going to conclude there, but before we go, I'm going to show you quite an extraordinary picture. There's many, many pictures of Alexander the Great. The pictures that are available are either formed from carved busts, from statues, but there is actually, and I'll show it in a future lesson, there's actually a mosaic of Alexander in battle that's all in full colour later on. And so they're able to determine from all of these statues that were carved from him contemporary at the time, plus this colour rendition of him, 
exactly what they look like. So they believe that this is what he looked like. He was 20 years old, and this is the appearance of Alexander III of Macedon to become Alexander the Great in the future. So you get to look in the window of time uh-huh. and get to see this is our most Amazing. accurate representation of anything that we've seen so far throughout the whole of the Bible because the information wasn't available. But of course, as time went forward, it, it changed. Now going back to the picture that was on the cover screen, we placed up here again. As I mentioned, that Alexander is wearing the diadem with the two tassels here, and he's got the ram's horn that's here. Now the ram's horn is actually from a male goat, and it's of the god Zeus Ammon. Now Zeus Ammon, and I'm gonna give you more pictures and information about this, when the Greeks overtook uh, Egypt, they syncretized two gods together, Zeus Olympus and Amon, the sun god um, from Egypt. And so each of the Greek rulers from that point in time started to wear these uh, horns and they were drawn in these images. And so this is what gives us the alignment with the vision of God gave the prophet Daniel that the shaggy goat is the king of Greece in Daniel 8, verse 21. Please note that he is the first king of Greece, if you will, who has an image with these horns. So in other words, his father, Philip II of Macedon, and his grandparents before him, none of them had images on coins or anywhere else that showed the horns here. And so this allows us to determine that Alexander the Great was in fact the shaggy goat of the king of Greece mentioned in the prophetic script visions of Daniel. Okay, and so that brings us to the close. I feel like apologizing for all the history, but we can't really get away from it at this point in the Bible. Um, I just want to mention that putting all this work into understanding the history is because the Bible doesn't have a story for each of the descendants but we can place each of the descendants into the period of history that they actually lived. They're listed in the genealogy of Jesus. They were real people. And we can find by placing them in time, the circumstances under which they lived and what influences would come against them. At this point in time, we're basically aligning ourselves with the prophecies or the visions of those who came before them, especially Daniel at this point in time. But as we get closer to Jesus, we find that the Jewish history starts to grow in abundance. So in other words, we have a lot more information and it's a lot easier to actually follow. So bringing the story to life is, uh, at this point in time, probably the most challenging part of the Bible that we actually have. However, when we read prophetic words, one of the things that happens for people is that they sometimes scratch their head and wonder who it is, when it was, Uh, Has it happened? Because people love to keep saying even to this very day that that the prophecies of the past have either been fulfilled, are being fulfilled now, or they're going to be fulfilled tomorrow. Everyone loves to guess when it's going to happen. But the Bible doesn't give us the information to tell us exactly when it does happen. However, in incidences like this, we find that the information is so specific and imagery connected to it in history allows us to pinpoint exactly who these people are, which allows us to say that these prophecies have already been fulfilled. And so the purpose of this journey of faith, where we're looking at this history, is not to give you a history lesson, even though it may be interesting, but it's actually to have you understand that these prophetic words have come and gone and been fulfilled. And of course, the reason for this is because we're following the genealogy of Jesus. And we know the journey of the Bible from the time of Abraham is to fulfill a covenant promise that the Messiah would come. And so all of these events are stepping stones in history that support the truth of the Bible until the Messiah in fact comes. All of this helps us to pinpoint exactly whom the Messiah is, of course, as well, and actually why he he came. Okay, so we'll close on that note. So if you'd like to watch this again, of course, we're broadcasting on Facebook. Um, This will be put up as a high definition video with all of the relevant information on the bottom of the screen for you to read on our YouTube channel. You can type in Paul Brunson, The Jesus Movement. And of course, they're also available on our website at thejesusmovement.com.au. 
So thank you for joining us. God bless you. And we look forward to your company next time. you